Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, so today, uh, I'm going to talk about an efficiency boost and tech debt. So bridges, obviously, is where we need to start, um, because all good things are described by slightly tenuous analogies that kind of fit most of the time. Uh, you may have heard of this bridge. It's the fourth rail bridge. It uh, spans over the fourth of Fife, and it's really important. It provides a really important rail link up. It sits between, on the line between Edinburgh and Aberdeen, I believe. And you may have heard the story of it's red, so they paint it, and it's so big that by the time they finish painted it, they have to start again. They've got some new paint now, so it doesn't take that long, and they only need to repaint it every 25 years. But the point is, it needs continual maintenance. It's something that's really important, and it needs looking after. So lots of little things that they need to do, including the painting, is what's needed to ensure it continues to be successful. So we need to sort of frame it of what is tech debt. So I think you know lots of people might think, oh, it's just vulnerable code or whatever, but it's it's so much bigger than that. It's anything that you sort of want it to be in some ways. Um, it's a debt, and debt is not always a bad thing. So you know, as you may have made a physical purchase in the real world with actual money. You know, you can take out loans, mortgages. It gives you that ability to get something as a trade-off. And that's why I really want you to think about what technical debt is. It's not, it's not just a certain thing, and it can be used in really positive ways as well. However, you know, you need to pay it down, that interest sometimes, because if you're paying far too much on your interest and it's cost, costing you a lot of actual money, it's not good. If it's slowing you down, if it's making it hard to deliver that value for your stakeholders, for your product, that's not great. So it's all about that opportunity, cost, and risk. It's, can I use this? What is it actually costing me on my project? You know, are we just starting off really early and we need to you know, even know if this is right for market? Could we use some of that debt not making everything perfect from the beginning so that you can actually find out if your product you know, fits in market, if it achieves what it needs to do, if it's actually going to be something that becomes successful. What tech debt isn't? Again, it's just things you might think, oh, it's tech debt. But again, you've got to evaluate it for you. Is it, it might be code that is really difficult, um, it's really hard for people to understand. It needs a specialist in a certain area. But if that is something that can just sit there and look after itself, it's not necessarily something that's causing you problems. And that, again, comes back to oh, it's all about that opportunity cost, that risk that's right for you with your project, your business, or whatever that scope is. So that's what I really want to try and talk about and you know the things that we go on to how we deal with it on my project, and you know w that it's not a bad thing. It can be really important and a really valuable asset. And it's not just about code or security vulnerabilities. There's also other facets to it in terms of you know everything, even the team members you have and stuff. They're all you know they bring certain knowledge and whatever. It's not it's not always tech as well. It's wider than that. So to talk a bit about what I've been working on, so the project I joined uh, last summer, it's been around for a fair while at the company I'm at. It's seven years old. It started at a different uh, vendor, a uh, supplier, sorry. And then it came to my company. It's been around for, yeah, seven years. It's been continually worked on. So it's got it's had several different teams. They've all been fairly small, though. I reckon there's probably never been more than 10 people working on it at a time. But there's been lots of iteration, uh, lots of different people coming in, different ideas, and it's grown and grown and grown. 
it looks something like that, which, yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. Um, you know, it's not the biggest project in the world, it's not the smallest, but there's quite a lot of complexity. And I think the hardest thing is there are lots of different ideas. So in the middle here, we have a monolithic service. Up at the top, this problem was solved with like eventing. So it's event driven. So it goes all through that chain and into queues. Someone thought microservices was a great idea. So we've got some microservices around. But then one of them was not so micro. So that's kind of like a service service, if that's what you call them. Uh, that one's big. The one next to it is one function. The one that, that one is, I don't know, 12, 13, 15. It's a lot. It's a lot bigger. So just talking about that really briefly is the thing that is difficult on this team for this project is, is the cognitive load. Every change covers different paradigms. So sometimes you have to work against that monolith. Sometimes you have to work on the microservices. Sometimes you have to remember, oh, it's queuing, and that makes it harder for us to test it locally. All of those different things are something that's difficult technically on our team. We've got seven, six languages. It's TypeScript, JavaScript, Golang, Terraform, lots of Python. Uh, I think that's it. <laughs> um, and again, even that in itself is tricky because you need to, you, we might have Python engineers, and it's like, oh, well, we've got to go look at the object-orientated Java stuff. The microservices are all quite functional styled. It's just, there's lots and lots of inconsistencies and in itself, they're doing things that are valuable, and that's really helpful. But yeah, as I said, that cognitive load for this team is, is what's really difficult. And it's switching through all those paradigms. There's different languages, there's different tools. It's all on AWS. So we've got Lambdas, WAF, S3s, ECS, containers, uh, SQSQs, uh, CloudWatch event streams, Kinesis log processing, all of the AWS acronyms have a bit of a place on that diagram. So again, you know, people that are maybe more specialized in Python engineering, got to write some infrastructure code. How do we make that easy for them? Lots of challenges, but, you know, yeah. Perfect is the enemy of good. And what this is saying is, Coming back to that sort of trade-off, as we said, with the debt, what opportunity, what risk? If you make everything perfect, if this was the most perfectly engineered system, we might have left out countless features or they might still be waiting to be built. The service might not be the success it is for the customer to last seven years. It's here, seven years old, because it's doing what the consumer, uh, the customer wants it to do. And that tech debt has just been traded off throughout the life of the service. But for us right now, it's kind of difficult. It's got a bit too much. So what I'm trying to help do is we're help trying to bring in ways to reduce it down. So had to get in a cat picture. These are my cats. It's a special cat picture. You won't find this anywhere else on the internet apart from on their Instagram feed, where there's lots of them. Um, so there's a good side to tech debt and a bad side. You can choose which of the cats is the good and the bad. I can tell you afterwards which one is which. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, again, as I was saying right at the start, there is a positive side. And again, with, with this service that we're working on, it wouldn't be where it is today if it hadn't occurred some of this tech debt. And if we'd have tried to pay it down too much, it wouldn't be delivering the functionality. It could have been thrown away. I mentioned uh, tech debt uh, to a speaker earlier. And he was like, oh, just rewrite everything, right? And that is what some people do. But you don't rewrite successful systems because the trade-off is too much. You know, you're going to lose so much just to rewrite it. And then you got, you're going to rewrite it bug for bug to work in the same way the existing one is. Is that valuable? So rewrites, as most people say, probably not a great idea all of the time, but there's definitely opportunities for, for sort of evolution. So 
So, yeah, mindful of those constraints. Those are what you will have to think about for your project. Uh, so for us, what we believed for us is, the first is team engagement. So as I said, we've iterated through, there's been lots of different teams effectively. Every time someone left or joined the project, it's a new team. There's probably been 30 or 40 teams that have ever worked on this service over those years because everyone's changed every so often. So we want to make sure that there's, you know, there's buy-in and understanding from the people who are working on it. It's super important because ultimately they're the ones that need to take the problems and, and turn them into a valuable output. So having them bought in, understanding, believing that they can make that change is, is absolutely paramount. It's, it's got to happen because if you're not sort of living and breathing these changes and continually thinking of them every day, you'd, they just get lost and you end up and you incur tech debt or you don't and it gets messy and things change, but always the team. And it, again, the team will change again. So how do we set up for success in the future? How do we make sure things are in place? Stakeholders is the next one, you know, work in a company, business is a business, business things need to happen, right? So we have stakeholders. Um, so this project, my company, is a, uh, we have a client, it's their service, and we provide that to them. So, you know, they've got to be on this journey as well. It's not just, oh, we need to do this and we're going to just say, oh, you want this feature? Uh, well, we're not going to come to that for two years because we need to do all this work to make things better and then we can do work again and add more value. That's, that's not going to work. They're going to be like, mm, I'm not really sure. There's all of these other challenges that are relevant to us. You know, <clears throat> they still need to meet their own targets. They might need to adjust to the market. The world still carries on whether you've got tech debt or not. You need to, you know, keep moving, keep them on board, keep them happy, help them explain stuff. You know, you've often, the stakeholders are not technical. You say tech debt and they think, well, all right, is that a good thing? Is it a bad thing? I don't know what it is. Or they could get it or the worst kind where they think they get it, but they don't. And then you have to try and unexplain it to people, which is always interesting. Um, and finally, your KPIs. So, so for us, this is our SLAs. We have a contract. It has specific SLAs in there. But uh, yeah, you all have your own KPIs that you need to be mindful of. And if you're not, this comes back to where we talked about what is debt and isn't for your project. If certain bits of what you believe are debt are not really affecting your KPIs, maybe they're not as important as you think they were. It might sound like, you know, that, oh, there's X thousand problems with this bit of code, but that bit of code runs once a month to do a reporting job. Is that okay? It doesn't always, it, you know, it maybe fails once every two years. Well, we all know it's a bit rubbish. Sign it over there, it's out the way. But that debt might be something that's valuable to you because you can use that leverage elsewhere. It's a big container ship. No more laughs? No, okay. That wasn't a real punchline. <laughs> Course correcting inertia is a really fancy phrase, but I quite like it now. Container ships have a lot of inertia. They have very small steering wheels, if you've ever seen one. Um, but, you know, it takes them a long time to turn. And this is another tenuous analogy after the bridge, you know, boats, obviously. Um, they, you know, they take a long time to turn these things, but they're, they're kind of successful, right? Look at all of that stuff they're transporting, all of that value they're bringing around. It's, it's got to go somewhere. You're going to take it and you've got to just, uh, come on, move it slightly so that it goes where you want it to go, hopefully to a port in the case of a container ship not sideways down a canal. That wasn't very helpful, apparently, for global trade. Um, but yeah, you can kind of think, so this project especially, being many years old, successful for the customer, 
it is like this big container ship. We have to just, we can't just go and go crazy and start ripping bits out and stuff because it's not going to move. Even if we wanted to, in that case, we can try, try to just rip bits out, but we'll get stuck. We'll fail. It'll, we'll try and move one bit over here and seven things over there will fall over. And well, I didn't even know they were there. That is actually something we started with right at the beginning. Where are all our code repositories? There's some over here we didn't even know about. So little things like that. So where do we actually start? What do we actually do? So we sat in a room and we started right nice and high level with our principles. And again, this is just our top three that we're going to talk about. But these have got to be for you, your team, your business, you know, whatever level you're working at here. So we talked when we looked at the architectural diagram, well, that, all of that complexity and overhead, well, that's our big thing. Decreasing that operational complexity. You know, we've got to live with this system. It's a small team looking after it. You know, we've got, you know, if I said there's, there's seven engineers on it and operations people and adds up to about 10 or 12 at the minute, I think. Um, you know, the number of services per engineer is massive for us. So everything that we can do in development to build new functionality that doesn't increase our operational scope, you know, we've got, I said we have four different design paradigms, maybe just choosing which one we wanted and kind of moving everything down to that one. That doesn't just help people making changes, but it helps the operations and service teams who are responsible for, you know, responding to incidents, responding to alerts. It's, you know, they come through, it's like, oh, well, this one is a Lambda. So we go to those logs there and we find this thing. And, oh, like this one is a container service. So we've got to go over here and then, oh, we need to do that thing in Athena where we copy the logs across so that we can see these logs because they're from the load balancer. So if this problem happens, all of that complexity is what we're, you know, that's our, for us, that's the big one to start paring down. Fast feedback, again, from the engineering perspective, it was the feedback loop for development was super slow. Building stuff locally, super slow. Pushing stuff to development environments and getting our stakeholders to be able to test them hours, days, spinning up environments, hours, costs, multiple thousands a month because it was doing the whole stack. Very slow, very frustrating. Lots of the anecdotal feedback from engineers is just, you know, they're so constrained by not having the ability to just write a bit of code, test it out, see what it'll look like in a semi sort of like deployed out environment. Local first as well. So this is a bit of my, my personal view on some of the things like uh, serverless is love it in production, don't love it locally yet, yet to find something that I'm really happy with in terms of a development approach, but that's what we had. So all of those microservices are running in lambdas. So it's, well, how are, how are the team running them locally? I was like, well, uh, kind of get a bit lost. So this is what we picked out. We sat in a room, got some buy-in from everybody that was involved. And you know, these are the things as principles that guide every decision we make every day. Every ticket that comes in, every feature request, every question from the stakeholder, you know, we go to these principles and go, does this change? Can we do this in such a way that we decrease operational complexity of the overall service? So, you know, we go and look at that architecture diagram and go, okay, well, we can pay down a little bit of debt by instead of changing the function in the monolith, let's move it to the place in the service where we want it to be. And, you know, and to do that, we want to make our feedback faster. So, what are we doing locally? How do we get all that to come together? So, yeah, principles, as I said, really key because it just gives you that direction. 
you know, it, it is that course correcting of that container ship, of that inertia. It's just, and again, even with these, you will have to make a bit of a trade-off sometimes. It's like, okay, we want to move that function, but if we move that function, we have to move these six other bits and rewrite all of this logic out of Python to Java. Is this, this change that we want to do really the time that we want to make that change and do it as part of this? Or are we just going to get distracted and spend two months changing this when actually if we wait for this next big feature coming up, then that means we're not even needing this code and we can actually just leave it there just that little bit longer and maybe take to something else to pay down some debt on. So yeah, what did we actually, actually do? Uh, we made some changes. So local development, because it's kind of starts near the bottom. You've got to go from local development, write some code, and get it all the way out to production. So that's where we started with. Creating frictionless development environments. That was the next one. And then you may have heard this. I think it was British Cycling a few years back. Marginal gains. We did some small things as well. Because big things and small things, they're both important. We'll get back to that point. So with local development, so I was saying, you used to have lots of things. So lots of developers, it would look like maybe this in the best case. Lots of window uh, terminals down the right-hand side with Python applications running and some JavaScript -y TypeScript stuff on the left because that was what the portals were. And the portals interact with the Python APIs. And every time you needed to make a change, you have to come back to your terminal. You have to remember, oh, I think it's that one, shadow, and cancel it and maybe like reload the environment variables because something changed and then run it again. And you know, after doing that for like a day on the feature ticket, I was like, mm, I don't want to do this anymore. So yeah, we made some changes. Now through the magic of Docker, it's one command. I think, you know, containers are still a thing. I still personally believe they're one of the sort of right in the terms of trade-offs, as I said, serverless sometimes. But you know, containers, we can run Python versions, all of the things to make it feel like it's running in those uh, serverless environments, but running locally really easily. So there's people in this room, like maybe sat in the front row, that have said how invaluable this is to them because, yeah, it's come. you come in to set this all up, there's a helper script that you just run that one time. So when someone joins the project, they run a setup script, it clones out all of their repositories, it sets environment variables where needed, it tweaks some stuff, it configs, it gets it all right, prompts you, like we support Mac OS by default, because that's where I wrote it on a Mac. Uh, we support Windows, WSL, uh, and Linux. So yeah, it's like points you out where the documentation is for the little tweaks you have to do to make it all run nicely on uh, WSL. And yeah, and then we do things like this, where we give them a nice dashboard. It's like, these are all the services, and you can click on them, and it'll take you to their documentation page. And we use fast API so that it auto generates the uh, open API spec docs and it's all right there and has buttons you can click on it to make it really easy. And someone that's maybe sat on this side of the audience at the front row said, like, I didn't even know some of these things existed because the team didn't. You know, they'd come in and they'd previous iterations would just work on one portal. So it's like, right, we get right, we clone that repository and it's OK, well, that depends on this Python API and this Python API. And then you try and run it, and it's still broken. And it's like you read the code, and it's, oh, there's actually another environment variable that tells you about this other API. So we go clone that down and bring that all together. And I think this is, yeah, it's, it's just brought to the surface a lot of what we actually have. As I said, that, that setup script clones all the repositories, and it prints them all out. And people are looking and like, there's a lot of things here. I think we're at 90 repositories, something like that. Which again, you know, it's not, we're not massive, massive, but that's quite a high number for a relatively small team. 
So we've got all of the application repositories and then infrastructure repositories like uh, for, for each most of each one and some higher level ones and some lower level ones. But just gaining that clarity and having everything visible is the step towards reducing that operational complexity because there's less unknowns. So when there's a production issue and it gets lifted up to the engineering team, it's like, well, we know which services depend on it. I know where the code is for that. I know where I need to go if I need to make a bug fix. I'm not just getting you know, the service team are passing to us, oh, there's been this error in this application and someone's going, oh, I didn't even know that application was one of ours. Uh, I'll have to go find the code. So, so yeah, local development is great. And I think, again, that fast feedback loop, when everything's running locally, you know, it, it's right there on your machine. Uh, one of the things I didn't mention is everything code reloads now. So, you know, everyone likes code reloading. It's been around a long time. People should have been doing it forever. I advise you, if your project doesn't have code reloading, turn it on and make it get, spend that little bit of time to set it up because saving you three minutes while that Python service restarts and reinitializes and does database migrations or whatever it needs to do, if you're doing that on every code change, that's, that's a lot of overhead for you. So little things like that, super, super valuable. And, yeah. So frictionless dev environments, what do we do? Well, we didn't do very much, as in we just did the same thing again. So we take that local environment that's running fully containerized and we just plonk it on AWS. It's just our sort of our start into this. We're looking to evolve it more, but we use uh, EKS, Elastic uh, Kubernetes Service, and we run essentially everything that we run locally in a namespace in Kubernetes. And you get a dashboard that is exactly the same as the local one, except these services are all running on AWS. So one of the big, big, big constraints we had with the old way is the time and the cost, two big constraints. So if it worked, the previous deployment would take four hours because the infrastructure code was written in such a way that everything would deploy all of the alerts, everything, literally thousands of, uh, no, multiple thousands of resources on AWS would all deploy. It's great when you need to test something at that scale. It's not great when 90%, I think we ran the stats, 93% of tickets we've done in the last six, six months didn't require any infrastructure code changes. They were purely functional application changes. So we don't need for a development environment to have all of the alerting, all of the high availability databases that the production stack has. We need something that just puts our services out there and lets us test out those changes. So it's that mindset shift from something that meets your functional and non-functional requirements to these environments that specifically only meet our functional ones mean that we can trade off a lot of stuff and have things that spin up really quickly, but obviously, you know, they're not highly resilient and stuff. But that's a big difference. And this was something that one of our stakeholders was quite sensitive about. These things cost two and a half thousand dollars a month. So the full, the full uh, old style, to be clear, uh, development environments cost a lot of money. And we could only run well, we had one static one as part of the CI pipeline. So we could only run five other ones. I said there's seven developers, so we couldn't even have an environment per developer, which often meant we, ha we have a very exciting page in Confluence where people check out an environment and give it back, and then someone else checks out another one. Again, just lots and lots of overhead, decreasing that fast feedback, making things difficult, slowing people down. So these, spin up in two to four minutes, uh, a bit faster when things are warmer and there's spare capacity in the cluster, a little bit slower if everything's cold, but they have um, the uh, Let's Encrypt certificates so that HTTPS works everywhere. 
They have databases that still persist the data so that you know changes can happen and we still um, they still work functionally. We can tear them down or make changes. We run our database migrations. We can do all of our functional work and move so much quicker. So yeah, as I said, we can run five of these at once. We've tested running 500 simulated environments. That costs about $2,500 a month. Uh, that's before you factor in turning stuff off at night, turning stuff off at weekends when we're not using it. So yeah, it's helped us with our KPI to a certain extent of making sure we're, we're not spending too much money from our client or we're spending the infrastructure money wisely. Um, but it's also massively valuable for the team. Just to call out another nice bit of tech, we use Argo CD, which has a lovely cute little logo. Um, but this, this is one of the things that helps us reach that speed. We just deploy out for a Helm chart. It deploys out all of those containers that we care about and gives us that functional service and yeah, takes minutes um, and has some really nice stuff where we can change versions of like the central and the central repository and it uplifts all of the other environments where they're not running specific versions. So again, it just helps keep everything running, less things for developers to care about, less um, drift in configurations. It's a really nice tool, but we're not doing a full on nerd out of our Argo talk, I'm sorry. <coughs> And finally, to talk about the marginal gains, some of the small stuff, the stuff that is the death by a thousand cuts, it's the things that happen every single day that it's just like, oh, that's a bit annoying, but it only costs us five seconds. But soon enough, that five seconds happening once, twice, three times an hour, times all of the developers, times all of the days in a year, gets really grating, it's not great for morale, and it is just that time sink. So then we do little things like this. So it's not amazing code, but it's a little bash function that uh, uses a FZF, if anyone's heard of that. It's a little fuzzy finder for the command line. And it basically gives you a list of all the project repos, because especially new starters, they find it hard to find where the stuff is. So it gives you a little list and a little UI that lets you pick stuff and a fuzzy search. So they know they want to work on a portal. They type in portal. It says, well, is it one of these three? It's a small thing. It took 15 minutes to fiddle the, the bash code to get it working. But people find that really valuable because they have to change between those 90 directories many, many times a day. So this is just a little thing that helps. Rubber ducks. If anyone's ever heard of rubber duck debugging, you basically just talk to a rubber duck and explain everything. Tenuous link to what we've created. So for one of our portals, uh, we normally, to test it, you run and you run from the Cypress end-to-end -end tests that run the automated tests, but they call out to a test helper and the test helper can run things behind the scenes. Well, if you're a human and you're just using the UI, you can't make a curl request like telepathically to make the data bit, like call the test helper and make the database do things. So we just float a little widget on the side of our portal that has buttons and it knows what page you're on. So it gives you relevant buttons to that thing. So you go to the home page and it's like, do you want to create a new virtual consumer? And you click that button and then you can go through the registration journey with a, a fake user. And that's really important for us because we can't just use ourselves all the time because we have loads of deduplication logic for our project. So we can't, I'm not many people, apart from the two voices in my head, I think it is. Um, so this is just, again, a little, a little thing that's really helpful. Padlock for security, HTTPS everywhere, Chrome, is very aggressive now when things are not HTTPS. It's seven, like four clicks now to make it show you the unsecure page. People were doing that because they were working on portals that 
tried to force HTTPS because they were loading third-party code and that would break if you weren't on HTTPS, but they didn't have stuff for local certificates. So we just spent a little bit of time. So as part of that setup script uh, on the first day when they join, it creates a self-signed certificate and then they never have to think about it again, apart from on Windows where you have to manually load it into the, the thing, but that's just Windows because WSL, two things, awkward. Uh, and let's encrypt as well for the deployed environments. They don't have to think about it. We just get certificates. It all just works. Everyone's favorite, documentation. <laughs> I'm just as bad as writing it as everyone else, but you know, you've got to make a conscious effort and thinking again about those team changes into the future, you know, they're going to need to see this and know what's going on and know how these things come together. So making sure we're doing that. And this is an amazing stock image of planning because we write Terraform infrastructure code and you have to plan it to know what it's doing, except at the current times, you have to push it to CI and then that has to build and lint it and run through the thing. And then 15 minutes later, it failed because you did something stupid. Well, we need to write this locally. You need to be able to get that fast feedback loop from the infrastructure code just as much as the code reloading in Python. So yeah, any new infrastructure code we're writing, we're moving it away from the current old pattern and meaning you can write it locally. <sighs> and if you can't measure it all, did it really happen? Well, maybe, but you want to know, right? So we do a couple of things, uh, a few things. We do something called quality views, and we also use a couple of other frameworks, and we also get anecdotal feedback, some of the softer stuff that's a bit harder to measure exactly. Uh, quality views, uh, they are basically a simplified view of your architecture diagram. So this is loosely the same as that one you saw earlier. And what we do is we create some scoring that we put in a big grid that looks like this. And at a super high level, we go through and say things like, is the code good enough? Is the testing good enough? Can we easily deploy it? Can we monitor it, alert on it? Is it scalable? We have some comments about if it's not. And that gives us this scoring, these numbers. And we can see here, down in this bottom right corner, we've got a little bit of a hot spot of the darker, nastier colors. So that gives us an area where we can go, well, is that tech deck? Can we go and look at this and go, oh, okay, that big nasty red service there, is that debt for us or are we happy with it? This scoring says, well, you're not very happy with it because it doesn't meet a lot of your criteria. So how, how what are we going to do about it? It gives us a place to focus. This, is, this one went down really well with our stakeholders. They hate that architectural diagram as the rest of us do. It's like, just means nothing. But this is a bit more tangible. It's colors, it's things, and you can go in and you can home in and say, well, those green things looking better. It's like, well, that's the newer stuff. So yeah, we're trying to do it in the right way. This stuff down below, eh, not so much. Uh, frameworks, ready for this? The Open Web Application Security Projects Development Security Operations Maturity Model, OWASP DSOM. Uh, yeah. <laughs> they also have this amazing sentence, identification of the degree of implementation. Yeah, yeah, they could work on the framework, needs a bit of branding, but it gives you again a view. This is something we use to focus on the lower level, the security stuff, the observability. So it's got logging, monitoring, uh, test intensity, Test it, yeah, all of that sort of lower level, touching on platform, touching on security stuff, because we kind of identified we needed those sort of different levels. We needed some stuff right down telling us, yeah, are we keeping our bottom line, our, our base infrastructure good enough? Development and Operations Research and Assessment, or DORA, as you may have all heard. So this one, we focus slightly higher up. This is more about 
the team and delivering value and tracking changes. To be honest with this one, we're struggling to find nice ways to automatically track some of this with, with the tooling that we've got. So it's a bit manual, but it tells us the information we need. Are we getting releases out? Are we releasing too many times with defects and having to roll back? It's, it's, yeah, it's targeting that, that higher level. And then onboarding time, as I said, the soft one, another call back to boats. Um, we've had a few team members join recently. Um, somebody that had joined the team uh, a couple of years ago or a year ago and had left and had come back contracting, they, set, they, they left and they didn't have all of the local dev set up. When they came back, we had all of the local dev set up. Three hours it took him to go from, I've got a brand new laptop, I've cloned everything, I've running, he obviously knew the project context, so he got a head start. Within three hours, he'd opened his first pull request for a change. Like, he obviously had a massive head start, but, you know, the technical hurdles have massively reduced. He would have been even quicker if he was on a Mac, he was on WSL, and we'd still not worked out every single kink. Uh, I can speed run it in, a, in about 30 minutes, including pulling all of the Docker images from uh, without caches. So don't forget about the anecdotal things, the smaller things. You know, do you want to think right back if you, anyone saw the, uh, the first keynote on the other morning, Wednesday morning, developer joy? Things are kind of hard, a bit harder to get concrete numbers on there, but it's equally important. So to start wrapping up then, the key takeaways, tech debt is good and bad. Don't forget about the cats. There's good sides and there's bad sides. It is very much a debt. You need to use that leverage if you, if you need to. If it gets too much though, you need to pay that down. It can, if it's starting to block, uh, Delivering value, if you're starting to see too many operational issues, there's definitely areas there that you need to work on. Tackling the big things and the small things. Again, you might you say there's a phrase, it's called quick wins. It's one of my least favorite because, they're the, in my opinion, it's the worst kind of lie because you're kind of lying to yourself that you're going to get it done quickly because especially in these systems that are old and successful, you said you pull that one thing over there and four things over there fall over. It's, it's, not, it's never quick wins, never really. So, yeah, you've, you've got to make significant changes at the right time. You've got to be able to, you know, go, okay, that big red blob on our, on our uh, quality view, that's a really tricky component because it does a very important job for us, but we're not happy with it. So at some point, we're going to have to go, right, we need to do something about this. It's going to be big changes in production. It's going to be things that maybe take multiple weeks to roll out safely, you know, so we don't have data loss. But yeah, you've got to do them because some, those are the bits of the debt that, you know, are just going to keep incurring massive interest. And yeah, you can get through it. It's all happy, yeah. You can get through there, you can reach higher performance, whatever that, you know, going back to those principles, you've got to find out what that means to you, your project, your context. You will get there if you, you know, take some considered approaches, understand what you have. So yeah, it's, 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 not, it's not the end of the world tech debt. Final boat, really impressed I managed to find a container ship owned under the fourth bridge. That's not an AI picture. This may be one of the only talks here that doesn't have any AI-generated pictures. Um, where are we going? As I said, we've got that sort of big architectural piece that, yeah, we need to get through that. Um, we want to make, that, as I said, our Dora metric collections are really quite manual at the minute. It's everyone's favorite data processing system of spreadsheets. So how do we make some improvements there? And We've, from making our local development faster, we made development environments faster, we're now like, and oh, the production release pipeline's the next bottleneck. 
So it's how do we, what changes are we going to make there to get through that? So that's what we're doing. That's kind of our next six months, as well as all of the, the feature development. So who was I? My name is Joe. I work at the data shed. We do things like this. We have a stand outside if anybody would like to come and say hello. But thank you very much.